Molly Carter and I'm here again with Jez Smith, a biology teacher at an academy in Nottingham. Hey folks. We're here again in the reptile room of his home for this revision session and today we're going to cover GCSE biology's genetic inheritance. We know our genes are inherited from our parents and the different combinations of these genes is what makes us all unique. So just looking at me and Jez, we're both from the human species but we've got very different characteristics. He's a male, I'm a female. We both have brown hair, but there is ginger stemming through your family, as you can that's see right. your daughter, and curly hair. Mine's not natural. And I think that's one of the big things to remember, is that most of the genes we've got are all the same, because we have two arms, two legs, one nose, and it's only the slight differences that we actually pick out and make such a difference within our population. Mm. It's just worth remembering that as we go through this. So genetic inheritance controls the characteristics of all living things. Um, we'll go through a few key terms for this module to start with, just to get our heads in the game. Let's do it. Um, so what is a gamete? Right, well you know you've got a basic cell, and inside that cell in a human we've got 46 chromosomes, which are made up of 23 pairs. Well, a gamete is a specialised cell that's had the chromosome number halved, so it's ready to combine with another one to make a whole organism. So a gamete is basically a sex cell. Where is DNA found and what is it? Right, well, DNA is an amazing molecule. It codes for life. It is the life code. And what we do is we find it located within each, nu within each cell, within a nucleus, which is bound by a membrane. So DNA is found in the nucleus of the cell. Where are the chromosomes found then and what are they? Right, now we get down to the nitty gritty. The DNA is a massive molecule. Think of it a bit like string. Now the chromosomes are basically when we wind up that string to make it into easy to manage and move balls. So the chromosomes are found within the nucleus and we tend to only see them when the cell's dividing. And the final one, what is a gene? Right, let's go back to that piece of string. Somewhere along the length of the string, there is just one particular piece of string that you're interested in. Now that small snippet is the sequence of DNA that codes for a particular characteristic. So a gene is an instruction in a much larger book of instructions, which is the DNA. So some characteristics are controlled by a single gene, such as fur in animals and red-green colour blindness in humans. Most characteristics are a result of multiple genes interacting rather than just a single gene. Each gene might have different forms and these are called alleles. Would you be able to explain alleles further for us? Yeah, I think the simplest way is to think of a deck of cards. In the cards we know that we've got aces, kings, queens and jacks. The thing is, we've got four different versions of each card. So each version is a particular allele. So we'll have four alleles for the king, as in hearts, diamonds, clubs and spades. An allele is just a version. The genotype is a collection of alleles that determine characteristics and be, can be expressed as a phenotype. So would you be able to define both of those words for us? Absolutely. Now remember, Looking at us, we can only see the differences between us. We have no idea what's actually going on in the cells, down in the nucleus, the DNA that we have. So we refer to the phenotype as our physical appearance. That defines us. That includes the results of the DNA, the genes that we have, but also environmental variation, so the fact that you've got your ears pierced. The genotype is the definition where it describes the genes that we have and the particular alleles that we carry of each gene. The genotype we can never actually see, but we can see the results of it in the phenotype. So to be honest, a lot of the time we're guessing the genotype based on what's in front of us. Alleles can be either dominant or recessive. What does this mean? A dominant gene is a gene that will be shown in place of a recessive one. So some people like to think of the dominant gene as being the stronger one, the weaker one being the recessive. One way of mapping gene combinations or monohybrid inheritance is through Punnett squares. This shows the possible offspring combinations that could be produced and the probability of these combinations can be calculated. Um, Punnett squares are likely to be used in the exam 
So we'll work through a couple examples with them. Let's take one of the reptiles as an example. What if the what if let's say Sophie and Spike were to meet with each other, and we looked at the gene for beard colour? What's the probability? That really comes down to the alleles that they carry. Spike has got a resplendent orange beard, something that really sets him out as different to Sophie. Sophie's a much sandier colour. So if Spike was a pure breed for the orange colour, then he would carry two orange alleles. If he were then to breed with Sophie and his orange to be dominant, it means that all of their offspring would then have the orange beard. If it's a recessive characteristic and he's only got the recessive, then all of the offspring are going to be sandy, just like their mum Sophie. It's important to remember during this process of fertilisation, the allele combinations created are always random, and that's why probability is used, because nothing's really guaranteed. Um, each of the four offspring combinations is as likely to happen during every fertilisation event. So even if it's more probable for our reptile to have the orange beard, it might come out sandy when it's born. Absolutely. So after looking at these, the different characteristics that are stored within our genes, how could we tell if a baby was going to be male or female? Very simply. And it's a good one to look at because it does come up in the exams. And particularly it's a foundation question. So it can be an easy mark win. Let's have a look at a Punnett square. Yeah, let's do it. So what we've got to think about is, first of all, males have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. So there's an immediate difference between the genders. Now when we look at it in terms of a Punnett square, and all a Punnett square is a simple square to match up combinations. It's the sort of thing that you'll have sorted out for a tutor group football team or whatever else. So what we can do is we can put the XY for the male up on the top. And if you notice, because they're gametes, I draw a circle around each one to show that they're a cell on their own. Remember, they've got half the number of chromosomes. The female then becomes XX down the side. Again, circle drawn around each of them. Now, these are just the probability of combinations. So if from the male, his X chromosome meets the X chromosome of the female, we'll get XX. That would be a girl. However, if his Y chromosome meets with the X, we get an XY. That's where we get a boy. And if you notice, I've now stopped drawing circles around because these are now whole cells. We can see on the following row, we get exactly the same. We get XX for the girl and XY for the boy. So as far as we're concerned, the probability of gender is 50-50. But we say that is just a probability. And if we look at the Beckham family, then in fact it's not been 50-50 and it's been mainly boys that have been born with one daughter. So if we move on to inherited disorders, um, we can look at, as an example, cystic fibrosis. Um, that's an inherited disorder of cell membranes that mainly affects the lungs and digestive system. Over the years, the lungs become increasingly damaged by this and may stop working properly. Now, cystic fibrosis is caused by a faulty recessive allele on chromosome 7, and to be born with it, a child has to inherit two copies of this faulty gene from their parents. Now, typically, for a cystic fibrosis to occur, we're going to have parents which are known as carriers, which means they have the normal gene, which I'm doing as a capital C, and the cystic fibrosis gene, which I'm doing as a small c. Now, where we're using the same letter for a condition, when we're doing the lowercase, I tend to put an underscore underneath of it just to make it clear. Because in the stress of an exam, it's easy to mix it up. Mm -hmm. So we've got two parents, big C and little c. Now, when we go down the first column, we can see that the first combination will be two normal genes. That child is not going to have cystic fibrosis. It's not going to carry the cystic fibrosis. They will never have an issue with cystic fibrosis. If we go to the next step down, we then see that normal meets the cystic fibrosis gene. Now that child will live a perfectly normal life. They will not suffer from cystic fibrosis. Their lungs will be clear, their digestive system will work perfectly fine. But they have the possibility of passing that on to their children. Going over to the next column, again, 
normal means cystic, so we get a carrier. Parents wouldn't be aware that their child had this when it was born. It would be perfectly normal. But there's then this one in four chance that the two cystic fibrosis genes are inherited, and so we now get a sufferer of cystic fibrosis. So there's a one in four chance that someone will suffer if their two parents are carriers anyway. But it is only a one in four chance, which means mm. you could still have eight children, but none of them actually suffer the cystic fibrosis. It's mm. just a probability. So, whereas here with cystic fibrosis, which is caused by a recessive gene, if we look at polydactyl, that's caused by a dominant gene, and it's an inherited condition where a person is born with extra fingers or toes. Offspring only need to carry one dominant allele from their parents to inherit the polydactyl condition. If we look for a Punnett square, I'm sure we'll find out that it's much more likely to get polydactyl than cystic fibrosis. Absolutely. Now, if we look at the Punnett square for this, here we'll start with the normal parent. So this is both, G, both alleles are for normal, which I've done as a capital P. If we then combine that with the other parent who has the normal allele, capital P, and the polydactyl gene, lowercase p, then we can start to look at the combinations. Covering the first row, we get two normal alleles meeting, and so we'll have normal. Again, next cell, two normal meet, and we get a normal child. In the second row, we've got normal meets the polydactyl gene. So that child will show polydactyl. And again, in the final cell, we've got normal meets polydactyl, and we'll get a child that's born with extra fingers or toes. So its probability comes down to a 50-50. And it's a very common, because having an extra finger or toe is not actually a bad thing. So there's no reason for that gene to disappear. Genetic testing involves analysis of a person's DNA to see if they carry alleles that cause genetic disorders, much like, I guess, looking for cystic fibrosis or polydactyl. It can be done at any stage in a person's life. How is genetic testing carried out? Well, the first stage of genetic testing is actually really quite simple. It's going through a family history and looking to see whether there are any signs of that condition having been in your family before. That saves time and also expense. Beyond that, it's normally about taking either a blood sample or frequently now preferred a cheek sample where we'll just simply swab for some cells from your cheek and we can actually look at the DNA there and we can look for certain flags as to whether that would suggest alleles are present. What is antenatal testing and neonatal testing? What's the difference between those? Well, anti means before, so it's before birth. Neonatal testing is testing after birth. And this is where frequently they do it with a heel prick test. We all will have had them, which is where a tiny sample of blood will have taken from the baby's heel that's then looked at and screened. What is a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is used in IVF? Basically, what we look at in IVF, we take a sample of sperm, and we combine it with some sampled eggs to then form the new life. What we can do through pre-implantation screening is we can look to see if there are any issues that would be present before we choose which eggs to implant. What are the limits of genetic testing? The limits of genetic testing are really about the amount that we know. Though we've got the Human Genome Project complete, so we know the mapping of all the whole human genes, we don't know how they interact. And as we said earlier, most features are controlled by multiple alleles. So as we learn more, and we've got clearly identified genetic conditions, we can start to spot patterns of inheritance that will tell us that that child is going to experience that. But again, we don't know everything that there is to be there. So we'll get an idea, we'll get an inclination, we'll be aware that it's more probable, but we're a long way away from having absolutely certainty about everything. Hmm. How do false negatives or false positives come, a come about? Well, the simplest way to think of this is to think of a pregnancy test. Millions are sold across the world and used. A false positive would be a pregnancy test that indicated that a woman was pregnant when she isn't. A false negative would be that the pregnancy test said, no, you're not pregnant, 
And yet, further down the line, we found that a baby was developing. So it's normally down to issues with the protocol. Going on to gene therapy. Um, gene therapy involves inserting copies of a normal allele into the chromosomes of an individual who carries a faulty allele. It's not always successful, and research is continuing to try and develop this possible treatment further. What are the basic steps that are used in gene therapy? Well, the first thing you've got to do is identify the genetic disorder that you want to treat. And then you've actually got to dive deep into the DNA and find the gene that is actually responsible for that disorder. Now, once you've identified that, we can use an enzyme called a restriction enzyme to cut out that gene sequence for a normal allele. We can then make many copies of that, which we can then use and we can insert them into a normal person's DNA. Now, typically, and this scares a lot of people, the best thing to do this is actually a virus, because viruses, by their nature, insert their DNA. But if we find a harmless virus, we can use the virus machine to inject that healthy allele. With the healthy allele instruction in there, the condition will right itself. Gene therapy can have a lot of major ethical implications in society as a lot of people disagree with gene alteration in people as they believe it's unnatural. But other people think that gene therapy is a good idea as it prevents unnecessary suffering in affected individuals. It only affects the individual involved in the process and not any other future generations who would be likely to inherit similar diseases. How ethical would you say gene therapy is? Again, I think it's got to be treated a lot like any medical treatment you've got to look at what you're doing what's the benefit of what you're doing is it something that we're doing because it truly will help or is it something that we're doing because we can do it and I think if we take that line of thinking and we're looking to the health and the welfare of the child then our steps in place are good going into family trees now and looking at pedigree analysis, we see that doctors can use a pedigree analysis chart to show how genetic disorders are inherited in a family. They can use this to work out the probability that someone in a family will inherit a condition. The pedigree analysis diagram is used to show the relationship within an extended family. Males are indicated by the square shape and females are represented by circles. Affected individuals are red and unaffected are blue. Horizontal lines between males and females show that they have produced children. So let's take the example of haemophilia and create a family tree to show the inheritance of this genetic disorder. Good. Now let's remember, haemophilia is shown on the sex chromosomes. It's only carried on the X chromosome. Now males are XY, females are XX. So if a male receives the haemophiliac allele, He's got nothing to balance that and will be haemophiliac. For females, because they have two X's, it's possible to have one normal X and one haemophiliac X, in which case she's only been a carrier and won't actually show the haemophilia. So if we look at our diagram, we've got Connor, who is male, and he's haemophiliac. So he's inherited XH from his mum and a Y from his dad. Because he's got nothing to counter that X, he's haemophiliac. Now he marries Isabella, who's a carrier. That means she has one normal X chromosome and one haemophiliac chromosome. Now their offspring, because of this, they have Charles, who is a normal boy. He's a boy because he got the Y chromosome from his dad, which doesn't carry the haemophilia ever but he also inherited the normal X chromosome from his mum. So he's perfectly normal. And if we look further along the line, then he had another brother, Pearson, who also inherited the Y from his father, which is normal, and managed to inherit the normal X chromosome from his mother. Now, unfortunately, their sister, Eliza, inherited the haemophilia X from her dad, and the haemophilia X from her mum, which makes her haemophilia. Now, we have made a lot of progress in dealing with haemophilia. So Eliza's gone on to live a full life and has ended up marrying a man who is neither a carrier nor a haemophiliac. But if we look at the knock-on to their children, and this is where the genetic counselling would come in, 
she has had a son who inherited her ex haemophilia and because he inherited the Y from his dad, which made him a boy, he's got nothing to counter that with, so he becomes a haemophiliac. If we look at his sister, Alma, she's inherited the X chromosome haemophilia from her mum, but thankfully got the X chromosome normal from her dad, so she is just a carrier. Now, typically in an exam, we would look to see what happened in future generations and you might be asked to explain why certain children became haemophiliac or what the chances were of them being a carrier. Follow the logic and just follow the pattern. The key is critical to understanding it. We'll move on to understanding genetics and Mendel's work. Um, he, w he studied the inheritance of different characteristics in pea plants. You've probably, he's the pea plant man, you've probably heard about him. He found that when he bred red flowered pea plants with white flowered plants, the offspring produced red flowers. When these plants were bred together, most of the offspring had red flowers, but some had white. Why is this? What gene is it that's dominant here? Well, you're absolutely right to pick up on Mendel, because he really is the grandfather of genetics and really worked out a lot of the rules before we had any clue what's going on. So if we go back to, yeah, a Punnett square, and we look at the situation that we've got. We've got red flowers and white flowers. Now, a lot of people make the mistake that they want to use the single letters for this, and so they'd have R versus W. Well, that's not comparing. Remember, these are alleles of the same gene. So the gene we're going to use is we're going to use a capital R for red and a little r for white. Now, because all of, the cat, all of the offspring were red, we know that red must be the dominant. That's the first giveaway. So if we look at the red flowers, we can look at it in two ways. We can have two red alleles in the flower. This would be known as homozygous, meaning same egg, against a pure breeding white flower, which would be two little r's. Now, when we look at that, we get the combination capital R, little r, for each of them. And they would all be red flowers, because the red is dominant. Mm. What I'd then be interested in, this is what caught Mendel's eye, is what happens in the next generation when we let those flowers interbreed. So, back to another Punnett square. This time we've got one capital R, one small r for each flower. Red versus white. When the pollen meets the ovule, we've got this flower, which has two capital R's. So that's going to be a red flower. We've got this flower, which has a capital R and a lowercase r. So it's going to have the red and the white, but red's dominant, so it's going to appear red. Same with the flower over here, capital R, little r. It's going to be a red flower. But this is the one that caught the eye, was we get this one out of this mixture of red flowers that inherits the lower R, the case R, and the lower case R to make it a white flower. So suddenly we've got a white flower appearing amongst a family of red. Um, his work was important because it expanded the knowledge of genetic inheritance before DNA and cells, like you said, have, had even been discovered. He was way before his time. But why was a lot of his work not accepted by scientists when he was alive? Well, I think the first thing is there weren't really scientists at the time. It was long before science was coined. And this was at a time when religion played a massive part in our life and our society. And so people really didn't like the idea that how you were wasn't because that's how God intended. So there was a lot of resistance to this new idea. Mm. So I think that's mainly the reason. There just wasn't the knowledge and it was a change in society. And of course, they didn't have the internet when they could post these ideas across the globe so freely. Yeah. So, I'll say that's the end of the session. Thank you for joining us with today's revision session on genetic inheritance. And thank you, Jez, again for coming and helping us out. Feel free to check out our website for the animated segments of today's session, as well as other revision podcasts. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Brilliant. Take it easy now. Thank you.